You know, Brother Pap, that tenderness that you talk about, that was hard-earned, wasn't it? And that was something that the Lord allowed you to walk through to develop that. I mentioned a place that the Lord took me in my mind when we were singing that last song during the offertory. He took me into a car ride that I was having with my dad a few days before his brain surgery back in April of 2008. Having one of the last moments I'd ever have with, with my dad that we could have a full conversation where he had full faculty ability with both arms, both legs, and, and the ability to speak and reason. And, uh, and I can remember how this onset of the effects of the brain tumor began to affect him emotionally. Uh, I remember how it shook his confidence. Uh, my dad, many of you saw him uh, back in 03, uh, that weekend that Christina and I got married. Many of you got to uh, meet him and see him. Just a, a congenial fellow, able to relate to many different walks of life. Very gifted, very anointed, very confident, uh, very educated, but yet a country boy at heart. You know, just uh, a very good disposition. And uh, in those last few Weeks and days, I remember seeing my dad weep more than he'd ever wept. Uh, as he told the story about the very first time that he blacked out because of this tumor expanding in his brain, he talked about how he, he was driving down the middle of the road and just blacked out. He couldn't see. He lost vision and, and came to a few seconds later in a parking lot, in a parking space. He just talked about how those kind of things began to happen. And... Uh, and I remember any time we'd begin to talk and share during those uh, days prior to the surgery, he would just weep. He would weep. There was just, it's terrifying. Ms. Kaler, you, you've seen Brother Eddie deal with sorrow and, and brokenness on a new level uh, when you walk through something like that. Those of you who have gone through cancer, not only going through it, but just preparing to go through it. There is just... And when you're going through things that you can't do anything about when things are going on in your body, there is a, a new level of tenderness and sorrow and brokenness that you get to. And, and uh, I remember those moments with my dad. I'd never seen him that way. Now, I've seen my dad minister, preach, pray, weep in the presence of God, but I've never seen him bawl in a car going down the road with he and I. Never. I've never seen my dad displayed those kind of emotions. And I can remember him telling me as he was weeping, he's like, he says, son, this one's, this one's getting the best of me. And that from father to son is how he talked about, in his own way, describing the, the overwhelming emotions that he was dealing with in that moment. Um, and the Lord showed me something as I was preparing uh, for, for part one in this series called The Journey. Next week is going to be a phenomenal message as we round out this, just a two-part series. Uh, next week will be a message derived from some notes that I took on our superintendent. Uh, he preached a message entitled, Stay Here. And I'm going to be borrowing from that message for next week. But this one is called, Follow Me. And as I was digging into the text for this morning, Matthew chapter 9 is where I need you to go for just a few moments. And I was watching and reading, because if you're like me and you read the text... If it's, if it's an actual account where the gospel is like a, a report of what happened. It's a historical report. And much of the Bible is historical reports of actual events. Now poetry and things like that uh, and songs uh, or even prophetic words may not have as visual a story behind it as the gospels that were, in, that were dealing with actual events that happened. And so when you're reading about Jesus encountering Matthew, the tax collector, for the first time, you can visualize this dude sitting at a booth that nobody liked, broken. So you understand tax collectors were Jews hired by the Roman government to steal money from other Jews so that they didn't have to do the dirty work. They hired Jews and hired them as tax collectors to go around and put the burden of the Roman demands on their own people. So Jews hated tax collectors. They were their own brothers that had become traitors. And so a tax collector was a hated person. And notice, who do they always group tax collectors with? Tax collectors and sinners. They're always grouped together in the text. 
And so that's who we're dealing with here. Matthew is this tax collector that's looked at as a traitor, that's an outcast, and uh, a lonely lifestyle. You got to think about Zacchaeus. He didn't have people he hung out with. He climbed trees and kind of got away from people to see what was going on. And so we're looking at this encounter. It says in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 9, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that Jesus was reclining at the table in the house. We don't know. who. We assume maybe Matthew's house, in somebody's house. He was reclining at the table in the house. And behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. With Jesus and his disciples. Verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard this. He said, It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Can you imagine Jesus showing up in your misery, showing up in your life, maybe a good day, maybe a bad day. We don't know exactly what's going on in Matthew's life the first time we meet him. We meet him right here when Jesus encounters him. We don't know where he's at. We know the baggage the tax collectors carry, which I've just talked about. And in the, in the midst of his life, Jesus, who I'm sure he's heard of, and he notices the crowd and all the disciples, they show up and Jesus says, follow me. Can you imagine Jesus looking at you and saying, follow me? Could you imagine Jesus coming into your place of work, unannounced, right into your life, right up on your front porch and calling you and saying, follow me? What is your response? Matthew's response was, anything's better than this, right? Man, I've been waiting for a way to get out of this. Been looking for some, something to do, but you can imagine willing to lay down that burden and, and be a part of a group of people, a man with no friends. Hey, if you've ever been lonely, when you hang out with people, it's amazing. Maybe if you've ever been deployed and you're over overseas uh, serving the military, when you get to come back home and be around your people and your family and your friends, how refreshing uh, when I would be gone to college to come home and see my family. Just refreshing. But this is a guy that was an outcast. Welcome into a group. You got Jesus and his disciples. And we don't know where Matthew was in the order of the calling. We know that there was already a following of Jesus. So he calls Matthew and Matthew said, absolutely, let's go. Where do I sign up? I'll leave this behind and I want to be a part of whatever you're doing. Matthew followed him. But it's interesting to see the very next thing that happened. That Jesus was in his house or in a house surrounded by tax collectors and sinners. Do you think that Matthew wanted to be hanging around all the other tax collectors and sinners? I would think not. I would think he would want to try to get as far away from that as he possibly could. And the very thing Jesus takes him to do is right back into what he used to be. Right back into a situation that he didn't like. Let me tell you what my dad is showing me about, or, or, or what God is showing me about what my dad went through. And my dad never once said that God is calling me into this situation. But it doesn't matter what test you face. It doesn't matter good or bad. Everything you walk through, God allows. Whether you decide to do it or if it happens to you, God allowed it. And whether you decided or it happened to you, as a child of God, you're responsible to represent him no matter what you face. So brother Pap, maybe God didn't ever show up and say, Pap, I need you to walk through this for me. But, you, but he did. Did, did Jesus ever show up on my dad's porch and say, Roger, I need somebody to have a brain tumor. Would you be willing to do it? He didn't ask my dad's permission. God ain't never asked my permission for anything. That doesn't stop him from calling me into things that I don't necessarily want to do. Matthew said, yeah, I'll follow. He probably should have said, well, where are we going? <laughs> but he was just ready to follow Jesus. 
And then Jesus takes him into the pit of the, the tax collectors and sinners. And here's a guy trying to disassociate himself. Do you think maybe the very place that God calls you into is the very place you don't want to go sometimes? I had never seen this like this. In the place that he least wanted to go, Matthew found himself with the other disciples, with Jesus, surrounded by all these other people, these other outcasts, these sinners. The very place that he wanted least to be. Because it represented a place of weakness. It represented a place of insecurity. Those are the places I don't want to be. I don't want to be in places where I'm weak. I don't want to, listen, I don't want to enter a left arm throwing competition. I got a weak left arm. So I don't sign up for those kind of things. I don't sign up for sewing competitions. I don't know how to sew. I don't want to do things I'm bad at. But what if the very place that Jesus calls you into is a place of weakness and insecurity? And that's exactly what he did for Matthew. And I remember my dad weeping. And saying, son, this is, this is getting the best of me. And in that moment, I realized what he was talking about. Because he realized that he was going to do that for God's glory, no matter what it cost him. Didn't Job say, can I accept the good and not the bad from God? Because when Jesus says, follow me, it don't mean, hey, let's go walk on water and multiply bread. It means, let's go die. Sometimes the very place Jesus calls you to go is the place that you don't want to go. It forces you to depend on God in a new way. The brokenness that Brother Pap has, I begin to see that in my dad's life over these last few weeks. I remember like it happened yesterday as I shook his hand and hugged him and kissed him as they were wheeling him back into surgery the very last time I ever had a conversation with my dad before his surgery. Now, I can still have conversations with him now. I just got to do most of the talking. My dad can say some cool stuff and he can respond, but I can remember the brokenness, even the trust that he walked into that situation with because he said, I'll follow you, Lord. Because following Jesus has nothing to do with what you want to do. It has nothing to do with what you like to do. But it has everything to do with replacing who you are with who he is. And we learn that in the very next part of this passage. When you are called into a place of insecurity for you, it forces you to depend on him. Maybe some of our students that just stood and that we prayed over, maybe they, don't, they haven't typed out and, and, and fashioned and, and stylized their testimony. You know, we get missionaries and different people that come through here that can put some polish on on a testimony because they've given it, they practiced it. Let me tell you about the country I serve in. I mean, they got their, they got their go-to stories and illustrations. You hear that. Maybe a student doesn't have that, so they're very insecure. But God wants students to witness to other students because they're forced to depend on Him when they do it. And God might call you into the very place you don't want to go because it forces you to trust in Him to speak through you. Amen? So the Pharisees, who are the scribes, the lawyers, the teachers that would walk around with the scrolls and they would lead people, they didn't like that Jesus' church was way bigger than theirs. <laughs> and so they would follow Jesus around and spy on him. And so this is what's happening. They're around the outskirts of the crowd here, maybe even in the house, but over in the corner because it says they were there and observing this going on. And it says that they went up and asked who? His disciples. They asked his disciples, why does he hang out with sinners? Why does he hang out with tax collectors? You know, there may be times that you have to speak for Jesus. So you better know him. You better know him. Because you might have to speak for him. But Jesus heard the conversation, so Jesus spoke up. And it's amazing some of the things that he said that you know. These are not uh, foreign scriptures at all. Jesus replied after hearing them trying to pick on the disciples who were just following Jesus. Jesus stood up and said, hey, hey, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And then he gave them homework. And Jesus only says the next statement four times in all of Scripture. 
Go and learn this. Once he's talking about the parable of the fig tree. Another time he's explaining to them that he is the only way to the Father. Specifically this statement, go and learn this. Jesus gives the Pharisees homework to go and learn this statement. And he quotes Hosea chapter 6 verse 6. He says, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And I'm here to tell you, church, when you read something like that, I get excited. Because I'm the first one. I'll join Paul in saying, I'm so far from perfect, it ain't even funny. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come just looking for perfect people? Are there some messed up folks that are only here by the grace of God today? Are there some people that have said and done things you're not proud of? That's right. Do you know that you're qualified to be called just like Matthew? Do you know that Jesus went to Matthew in the midst of his sin? In the midst of his betrayal of his own people? Jesus called him out of his betrayal? We, we, we're messed up if we think we have to get to a certain level before we can follow Jesus. Jesus wants you just like you are. And then he says, learn this. And he lays out this statement that we can all learn from, that I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And the statement to learn this literally means practice this. Practice this. Put this into practice. I can watch YouTubes all day long about how to wakeboard. I have never gotten up out of the water. And Brother Chuck fits you, older than me, does it easily. But he's practiced. <laughs> I don't know how to practice <laughs> It just doesn't compute. Jesus says, practice this lifestyle. Practice mercy. Practice compassion. Practice grace. He's learning. He says, learn this. Put this into practice. Literally, he's saying, have mercy toward one another. I desire you to have mercy more than for you to find victims. That's literally what that statement means. I desire for you to extend mercy and compassion between one another more than I want you to stand up there and look down your nose at people and drag a victim. And I wonder how many times we see somebody that does something differently or doesn't do it the right way. Or maybe they're just an outright sinner. Maybe you know uh, people that are lost in drug addiction and have no desire to repent. Maybe you know people that are living in same-sex relationships and, and committed to that lifestyle. It's easy to say, my goodness, they're a lost cause. And Jesus says, I desire compassion and mercy more than I desire a sacrifice or a victim. Because these Pharisees, they represent the authority, the, the, the book-toting, uh, law-quoting um, translators and lawyers that would constantly get in these scuffles. And here's Jesus saying, guys, it's more important. It's more important for you to try to restore somebody to my kingdom than to make an example of somebody. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Because if Jesus is Son of God can go to somebody, someone knee-deep in sin and call them to follow him to be a disciple, then I think you and I need to look and see how we reach out to people. Because I think I find myself about people a lot more than I find myself going to their door and trying to pull them out of that sin. Jesus wants you to extend compassion more than you judge people, more than you sum people up in just a statement or two. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, the prophet is talking about a time where God literally almost wiped his people off the face of the earth with judgment. And he is allowing this prophet to be mistreated. He is allowing this prophet to go through some tough things. And some of the words of this prophet talk about how God has cut us in half, but yet on the second day he restored us, on the third day he brought us back to life. And he quotes the words of this prophet. What Hosea wrote was that I delight in loyalty rather than in sacrifice. And in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Because the key to following Jesus is understanding what following is. And I, want, I broke this down for just a moment. What does it mean to follow? And there's a progress, a progression to the stages of following. It, it's not too unlike the stages of getting involved in a church. The first stage 
that Matthew uh, participated in was called to accompany. When someone is asked to follow, now Carson is not feeling well, so he was in here. I was going to get him to kind of follow me around. But the, the first stage to say, uh, would you follow me, is to accompany me. That means, you know what, I'm interested in what you're doing. And I'm going to walk around with you, and I'm going to see what's going on. I'm going to see if it's something I really want to be involved in. It wasn't like you go from, oh, I don't even know you, to being best buddies. There's a progress of a relationship. And it's the same way with us in following Christ. Aren't we closer now than we were when we first met him? I sure hope so. I sure hope it's not just an acquaintance. And this is what we see Matthew go through in this uh, action of following Jesus Christ. It first means to accompany. The second phase of following is to actually join. You know what? I like you guys. I get along with you guys. I really like Jesus. He's got some great ideas. I like his vision. I like his direction. I, I feel like he's going places. So I'm going to join this group. Where do I sign? So then you become, you know, that might be like when you apply to the church, you might just be somebody, hey, I like that church. I'm going to start going to that church and I'm going to, to see what kind of style of church they are. I'm going to see if I like that pastor. I'm going to see if I like those people. I might even go to a class and see what those folks do. I might even go to somebody's house. And you're just kind of observing. But then at some point, you know what? I want to identify with these guys and I'm going to join. And that's the process of following. And the second one, or... If first is a company, second join, the third one is to become a disciple of. That is to become the apprentice. That is to try to become as much like that leader as you possibly can. In our relationship with Jesus, we've all had times where he's come to our lives, into our situation, into our kitchen, whether at work, whether at home, whether at an altar experience, and he's pointed his finger at you, and he said, follow me. Remember those posters? Uncle Sam needs you, and you know, the... Imagine Jesus coming to you and saying, follow me. And you might be like Matthew. You don't like where you are. And you're like, yes, I need some hope. I gotta get out of where I am. I gotta get out of who I am. I don't like my attitudes. I don't like my behavior. My, my temper, my frustration, my raised voices are, are causing too much damage. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to this. I need some hope. And you might be just like Matthew. Yes, get me out of here. But you're not all in. And if you're leaving sin for righteousness, sometimes you still have remnants of that. Some behavior, some speech patterns, some attitudes. Some acts, some thoughts, some bad habits that you take with you. But then there comes a point where you allow Jesus to come into your heart and you join the movement. You're no longer just accompanying, you're no longer observing, but you join the movement, you commit your life to Jesus Christ, you surrender, and you're participating, and you're involved in church. And at some point you become a member, not just in joining the church, but you begin to participate as an active part of the body of Christ. And serving in the kingdom of God. And you become a disciple trying to be as much like Jesus as you can. And we see that's what Matthew is going through here. And listen, the very first place that he had to go into was into the belly of the beast. Into a very uh, a place full of temptation with other tax collectors and other sinners being seen right back in there. It's like, man, I'm trying to change and this is where God leads me. But just think about it. Because he was willing to follow and go into a place he didn't want to. Who do you think was able to relate more with the tax collectors than anybody else? And any of the other disciples, who do you think? It's like Jesus knew what he was doing. I need a diplomat that can speak tax collector language. So he recruits a tax collector. You think Jesus just went by and whimsically picked these guys? No, he had strategy. He's like, I want to reach these guys. I want to reach these guys. I want to reach those guys. So Matthew's sitting in there with his buddies and able to tell them about this guy that's changed his life. That's called him out of darkness and that there's hope for them too. They don't have to be the reject of the nation. You accompany, you join, you become a disciple. Matthew begins to take on the attitude and the personality of Jesus. Matthew begins to extend compassion rather than seeking out victims to judge. Seeking to restore rather than make an example of people. It's amazing. As a tax collector, he had been ridiculed and judged and mocked 
for however long he did that. And this is a guy that has been beaten up, beaten down, and all of a sudden he begins to overflow with joy and grace and forgiveness and loyalty. You accompany, you join, you become a disciple of, and then there's a fourth part of following, and that means to succeed. Not as in to do well, but as in to carry on in that position of and to replace. Because that makes sense, right? A literal version of follow means to actually come behind somebody. Jesus called them to accompany him, then to join him, then to become a disciple of, and then ultimately, knowing he would be taken away, he called them to succeed, to be him while he was gone. So are you succeeding in succeeding Jesus? Are you truly following him? Because I'm afraid there's people here that are still in the company. I'm still trying to figure this out. I'm not ready to really sell out and become what Jesus. And then some people, maybe you've joined the movie, you consider yourself a Christian and you're living for God, but you're not really serving and trying to be a disciple. And maybe some of you are. Maybe some of you are all in and you're serving in the body of Christ and you've committed your life, you're givers, you're faithful, you're here whether I'm here or not, you're here no matter what the weather's like, you're here no matter what the season is, you're all in. But there's more to following than that and it's to succeed and it's to carry on and there was a point just a little bit later in the book of Matthew in chapter 10, 11, 12 where it says that Jesus sent the disciples out can you imagine if you will for just a moment these guys that had only ministered with Jesus, that had encouraged, that had exalted, that had uh, cast out demons, that had seen people healed, raised lepers up and, and, and lame people and, and seen blind eyes open. They'd seen all this. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, now you go do it without me. <laughs> what? And he begins to lay out the plan that you don't take an extra pair of shoes, you don't take an extra belt, you don't take any money with you, and you go and live on faith. Man, and never more in my dad's life has he had to depend on God as when facing that brain surgery, not knowing what. Now, it's been seven years now, and we still have dad. It's, it's a miracle. He's, no doctor would touch him except the one doctor that did operate on him, and we knew there was a risk. And God is calling you to follow today. Not because you are dreaming of greener pastures or some perfect destiny. There's tests. There's challenges. And Jesus is saying, would you follow me even if you had to go through something you don't want to go through? Will you follow me even when you can't see me, even when you can't hear me, even when it doesn't feel like I'm there? Can you still follow me? There's been times over these last few months of Brother Pap's life where there was no release from the pain. There was no sleep to be had. There was no rest to be had. And, and there was nothing but frustration and pain and, and a, a, contri a complete brokenness and weeping before the Lord. And Jesus said to Brother Pap, follow me, Pap. I know you can't see me, but I'm here. Church, God is calling us to follow his son. God knows exactly what's going on in America. He knows exactly what's going on in our culture. He knows the attack that our faith is under. He knows the, the pressures that are on us as Christians. And he's looking at you and he's saying, come follow me. And will you follow today? I want you to bow your heads with me this morning.